Good afternoon everybody, Mrs Brunley here. I um, hope you're all doing well and you're keeping yourselves safe, okay? Make sure you're getting out as much as you can in the sunshine when everything's dry outside, okay? Um, this afternoon I'm going to carry on reading the Year 6 text to you, okay? So, roof toppers. Okay, we're at chapter 9. Now, um, chapter 9 does have a little bit of French in it. I'm not going to lie, French is not my strong point at all. So you're going to have to humour me and presume that Mrs Brunny's pronunciation is actually ace. And um, yes, I'm fluent in it, obviously. Um, so yeah, here we go then. Okay. Rue Charmaine was easy to find. It was 10 minutes walk, 10 minutes through cobbled streets and window boxes full of red carnations and children eating hot buns in the road. Ten minutes in which Sophie's heart looped the loop and danced the jitterbug and generally behaved in a way entirely out of her control. Hold steady, she whispered to herself, and then, stop it, that's enough. Did you say something, said Charles. No, I was singing to the pigeons. The shop had a plaque above the window. There was a violin in it, resting on a bed of silky stuff and some flowers. Everything except the violin was covered in dust. Inside it was a sort of overfull shop where everything looked ready to fall off the shelves. Sophie poured in her stomach as, as they went in and glanced nervously at Charles. He was so long. He did not always take care where he was putting his legs. Hello, Sophie said. And Charles added, Good afternoon. Nobody answered. They stood stock still, waiting. Sophie counted five minutes tick past. Every ten seconds she called, Hello, bonjour, hello. I think it's empty, said Charles. Shall we come back later? No, we'll wait. Hello, called Charles again. I have a cello child here. She needs your help. There was a noise like a horse sneezing, and a man appeared from a door behind the counter, rubbing his eyes. He was stooped, and his paunch sat over his belly, like a mixing bowl stuffed up his shirt. Je me cuse, he said. He spoke some quick French sentences. Sophie smiled politely, but blankly. She said, Mmm. Pas du tout, said Charles. What did he say? Sophie whispered. Ah, the man smiled. I said, I have been napping. You are English? His accent was thickly French, but he spoke easily. Gonna aid you? Yes, please. At least, I hope so. Sophie laid the plaque on the desk. She crossed all eight of her fingers. It's this. It was screwed to the lid of a cello case, said Charles. Can you tell us anything about it? The man did not seem at all surprised. Bunso, of course, he said. He fingered the plaque. This is mine. I engraved it myself. These are tacked to the inside of every case, under the green baize. Yes! Sophie uncrossed the fingers, recrossed them. Yes, that's where it was. It must be old then, said the man, because we stopped using brass ten years ago. We found it was rusting under the baize. Were they under the baize? asked Charles. Surely that rather defeats the point. But of course, so they don't scratch the cello. But the address is there, if it is needed. And... Sophie held her breath, and then had to let it out so she could speak. Do you remember which cello it went with? Do you remember who bought it? Of course. Cellos are expensive, my child. A man will make only 20 in his whole life, perhaps. You see, the serial number 291054. That means it was a 29 inch. I have made only three such cellos in the last 30 years. The norm, as I am sure you know, is the 32 inch. Who bought this one, though? Sophie inched the plaque closer to him on the desk. This is the only one I care about. That particular cello, I think, was bought by a woman. A woman? Sophie's inside spat out, but she held steady. What kind of woman? A handsome kind of woman, I think. Charles said, could you be more specific? How long ago was this? About 15 years. Perhaps more. Perhaps less. She seemed fairly normal, as beautiful women go. Beautiful women are usually a little odd, I find. What else was she like? Sophie asked. Please, what else? She was tall, I think. And what else? What else? Sophie said. She pulled the neck of her jersey up to her mouth and bit down on it. What else? I'm afraid nothing very much. Please! There was a roaring in Sophie's ears. It's important. It's so, so, so important. Well, I 
remember she had a musician's fingers, very pale, like the roots of a tree. Yes, and what else? said Sophie. She had short hair and a lot of movement around the eyes. What colour hair? What colour eyes? Lightish, I suppose. Yellow hair or orange, je ne sais pas. Please, please, try, it's important. I would like very much to help you, he said, but I must admit that I'm not good at faces. I am better at instruments. He squinted at the two of them, standing side by side in the gloom. But she looked, I think, very like you. Not you, sir, you. Are you sure, asked Sophie? Do you swear you're not making it up? Swear that you're sure. Ma petite belle. When you are old, you are rarely sure. Being sure is a bad habit, the man smiled. His skin creaked. Don't go. He lowered himself into a seat. I have an assistant. He was there when we sold it. He will have a better memory. These days, I only remember music. The assistant was hard and angular, while the owner was soft and wispy. The two spoke in French. Then the younger man turned to Charles. Yes, he said, I remember. Her name was Vivian. A name coming so suddenly was like being punched. Sophie's breath left her body. She could only stare. Charles said, Vivian what? The man shrugged. I don't remember. A colour, I think. Rouge, perhaps? I don't know. Vert, perhaps? Oui, I think vert. Vivian! Sophie's insides pirouetted. Vivian, it was a word to conjure with. Charles said, thank you. Do you remember anything else? Was she married? Did she have a child? She was not, and she did not. The assistant had tough eyes and a sneering mouth. But she was poor. Her clothes were a disgrace. And I would not be surprised to hear of any number of children. She looked the sort of person to end in trouble with the law. What? said Sophie. He sniffed. She had a lawless looking mouth. Charles saw Sophie's face. He intervened. And was she a professional musician, he said. The assistant shrugged. Women are not professional musicians in France, sir. Thank God. But she played that cello in the shop until I stopped her. Sophie said, you stopped her. Little girl, please do not take that tone with me. She was disturbing the other customers. Was she good? This man didn't seem to understand how important it was. And she wasn't sure how to make him see. She drummed on the desk with her fists. Was she wonderful? Shrugged again. She was a woman. Women's talents are limited. Sophie wanted to hit him, hard, with all the muscles she had. She wanted to bulge on him with one of the violins on the wall. The man said, she, she was peculiar. There was a cough. <coughs> the old owner had come round from behind the desk and was standing at his assistant's elbow. He held a cello bow like a horsewhip. Try a little harder, please, Mr. L. Mr. L flushed. I meant she was peculiar in musical terms. She played funeral marches in double time. She played for us requiem without the necessary dignity. She did, said Sophie. She did, the only smiled. I remember that. That I do remember. She said she knew nothing but the funeral marches from living near a church. A church, asked Sophie. Did she say which? None. But she said people should be able to dance to music. So she learnt the church tunes and played them double time. Sophie loved the sound of that. It was something she would like to do herself. And she was good. Wasn't she? I just know she was good. Her fingers tingled. Good has nothing to do with it. It was indecent, said the assistant. She made solemn music, frivolous. It wasn't... Come on, Lefort. Could you demonstrate it for us, said Charles. No, he said. I could not. The owner straightened himself back. It crept like a revolt. A revolver, sorry, it, it cracked like a revolver shot. And Sophie once, I could, he said. Miss Lilla looked staggered. Monsieur, think of what your doctor said. As a favour to the little girl, he pulled a cello from its case. Listen. The music started slowly. Sophie shivered. She had never liked the requin. The old man bit his tongue and quickened his pace. The music sped up to a march and then to a run until it sounded rollicking and sad at once. Sophie wanted to clap in time, but the rhythm was hard to capture. It was music that kicked and spun. It's like a rainstorm, she whispered to Charles. That's the music a rainstorm would play. Yes, said Charles. 
And the man overheard and called over his playing. Yes, exactly, Cherie. That is exactly. Soon, far too soon for Sophie, the man put down his bow. There, he said, something like that. She was faster than me, I think. But, the assistant said, she did not play as elegantly as Monsieur Estoul. She rushed with her bow. The young are foolish and prize speed. Charles raised an eyebrow. Eyebrows can be powerful, and Mr. Lille looked quelled. I admit, said Mr. Lille, that I have never heard anyone play as quickly as the girl. Vivian, said Sophie. She said it in a whisper. She was called Vivian. Yes, Vivian, said Monsieur Estoul. I remember clearly now. I think she was extraordinary. Mon Dieu, the speed. I would not have thought it possible. But it was not a, pr a proper way to play, said the assistant. I was not impressed. I was, said Monsieur Estoul. I was, and I am not easily impressed. Sophie left Charles to do the thanking and the farewells. She couldn't speak. She needed to keep the music in her head. Sophie had a corner of her brain. It felt near the front and to the left, in which she kept music. Now she stored it away there. That's the end of chapter nine then, guys. Take care and I shall see you soon. Bye.